Okay, we are recording. So I'm very excited to introduce Deborah, who is going to be presenting today on library diversity residencies. This was an actually a special request um, program from one of our frequent ULVLC participants. So I'm really excited um, that Deborah was able to pre present it for us and that we'll have it recorded and up on that ULVLC LibGuide that everyone knows so well. Um, and that's that's it for me. So I'm going to turn it over to Deborah, and we'll get started. Hello, hello. So this will be real chill. Uh, feel free to ask questions at any time. I think some of this is material that some of you have probably heard in like some combination or other through various other presentations um, that I or Gerald have given over the last couple of years. Um, so it may be duplicating material, but hopefully some of it is new for some or all of you. So library diversity residencies, let's get started. Hello, I'm Deborah. I included this slide because I usually have this slide when I do this presentation. It usually goes over well uh, because baby photos. Um, so I was uh, born in South Korea um, and came over to the US when I was about uh, five years old. Um, and being half Korean um, and not technically being an immigrant because I was also born an American citizen. So my dad was military, um, but having a lot of those immigrant experiences with um, having, um, you know, um, English technically was not my second language. I acquired them both at the same time, but that's another story as well. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the same immigrant experience that a lot of people have, which is, you know, um, answering the phone for your mom because the English is not so good and having to deal with like um, like all the grown up things over the phone when you're nine years old and trying to translate stuff and things like that. Um, and also the translation issue is a thing because um, like many immigrants, um, my mother was really concerned about how well I would do speaking English in a school in the middle of nowhere, Louisiana that did not have an ESL program. Um, so she stopped speaking to Korean to me. We had like no other Asian population there. Um, and um, I lost a lot of my Korean ability over the course of that time. So I'm, um, I can speak some Korean, but I would and call myself fluent um, and that contributes to a whole lot of like identity issues as I'm sure you can imagine um, but yeah I like to preface with this because um, like frankly we're talking about diversity residencies diversity residencies which I will talk about um, in a minute and how they differ from other kind of residencies and from various definitions of diversity a particular program that we are involved with specifies diversity as being uh, aimed at um, um, ethnic and racial minorities. And um, a question I get as a mixed person is very frequently like, well, what exactly are you? Um, which is, I think, in this case, a legitimate question because a lot of residencies um, like don't work too hard at ensuring that their residence, residency is, is reserved for people of color. Um, so I like to preface with this, like this is my background, um, to explain what sort of ambiguously ethnic I actually am. Um, so diversity residencies, what are they? Um, they're uh, post MLIS positions aimed at providing recently graduated professionals with real working experience. That's the definition that you see most often and it's the one that Jace Alston, who is UNCG's first diversity resident, um, put in, um, um, stated in, in some of his work in his doctoral uh, dissertation, which centered on diversity residencies. Um, the express goal of uh, diversity residencies or of a majority of them are um, to recruit and retain a more diverse workforce in professional librarianship. Um, Let's see. So diversity in librarianship, how is it? It's not great, Bob. Like, uh, there are more recent stats than this, uh, but um, th this is the one that I pulled up because it's the one that's centered, or, well, at the time that I created the slides was front and center on ALA. When you started doing research on this um, and you just do a basic Google search, 88% um, of credentialed librarians are white. Um, and the numbers have changed somewhat. There are slightly more updated numbers from, I think, um, 2017, um, and ARL has some more updated statistics when it comes to academic librarianship. But broadly speaking, librarianship as a whole has like stayed pretty averaged out at about 85 to 88%, um, has not broken 90% um, of, um, or sorry, has not gone lower than 80% um, of white, mostly white ladies, but white people. Um, and uh, it, it hasn't changed much at all. <laughs> um, has stayed pretty steady at um, between, around 85% white. And I often include this slide because you can see there near the bottom that um, diversity is uh, one of the core values of librarianship as expressed on the ALA website. 
Um, so yeah, it's a problem. Um, these numbers are, are also pulled from um, that uh, from a recent study and uh, posted it um, in ALA. Um, the journal librarianship in 2010 um, was still super white. And if you compare the two pie charts, it is not reflective of the demographic diversity of the rest of the United States. Um, this is for all libraries. Um, as far as I'm aware, Susan, I believe that's um, where I pulled it from. I'll have to look and get the link um, in the notes. Yeah. Um, but academic librarianship is worse. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, this is a screen cap from um, an issue of Library Journal from November of 2018, which had a special report on um, the, the issue of diversity in careers and librarianship, which I do recommend if you can get access to that article to have a look at it. Um, there have been various efforts to address this. One of the major ones that you might have heard of is the Spectrum Scholarship Program um, that ALA runs, which has been like incredibly successful and um, done a lot of great work. Um, so library diversity residencies are just one part of what I like to call the EDI ecosystem and what library land is trying to do to address this. Uh, but despite that, the numbers aren't really getting any better. So residencies at UNCG. Um, we've had a residency program here since 2008. Um, the very first one I mentioned earlier was Dr. Jace Alston. Um, it's been coordinated by Gerald, who you should all know, I believe. Um, and um, from 20, 2008 to 2018, the last five residencies were two years in length. Um, mine got extended last year to a third year. Um, this is in accordance with the ACRL Diversity Alliance uh, recommendations, primarily because um, Again, the stated goal of diversity residencies is to try to help scaffold and prepare early career recent graduates for their first post-residency position. Um, and most, uh, I don't know how recently you've been looking at um, job ads, but most of them have a little line in there that requires uh, or strongly prefers three years of um, minimum experience, uh, which the two years doesn't quite cut. So. Um, that's been an obstacle that residents have reported um, over the last many years. Residency programs have been around for at least um, two decades. Um, so that being a consistent issue um, here at UNCG, they decided to extend it to a third year. And depending on how budget things go, hopefully that will continue to be the case with this residency going forward as well. Um, so a little pause there, uh, gonna break into talking about other um, like EDI issues specific to residency that we've been doing here at UNCG, um, specifically the uh, Library Diversity Institutes project. Um, have any of you guys heard about this thing that was going on here at the libraries for the last couple of years? Yes, at least one, two. Steve, you were at that webinar the other week. I know you, you know about it. <laughs> Yes, there's Wanda. She was very nice to be able to um, come speak with us our first year. Um, so this is a picture of our cohort from that first year in 2018. So, oh, there's, there's me peeking out. I forgot I was there. Okay. Um, again, like that's this, uh, I meant to take that slide out. Sorry. Um, so, Residency programs are now pretty well known, um, like the concept of, or the name of diversity residencies as a thing that's out there um, is pretty well known as an approach for increasing uh, the diversity pipeline, um, as well as for uh, providing experience to librarians. Um, but um, what actually residents do or how best to serve the residents um, is a little, a lot more undefined. Um, there are two particular issues that are um, pretty common, uh, commonly reported by residents, um, if not during their residency, then after their residency is over. Uh, one is um, the isolation that is experienced by residents. Um, many residents, like, like myself here, I'm the only resident, um, and we don't have cohorts. Um, although there are increasing numbers of institutions that do have um, like maybe two or three residents or have them overlapping if they're not in a cohort um, sort of style where they're all um, happening at the same time. Um, or sorry, where their um, terms are exactly um, beginning and ending at the same time. Uh, that being said, um, even, even though that 
is the case in some instances, like I think the, the Harvard residents and so forth, they might technically have multiple residents, but they're serving in various different departments, so they don't often get to interact with each other. All which is to say, um, residents are often the only resident, which is already isolating enough to be one of the only term limited positions that's not, you know, um, like a student worker internship, like you're a real grown up librarian, but you're term limited and already very different and set apart from from all of your other coworkers who um, don't have to deal with that precarity. Um, are often the only person of color at their primarily white institutions, are often the only particular uh, person of their particular ethnic group or um, religious affiliation um, at that um, at their library, um, if not at their institution as a whole, um, which I have heard reported. Um, and are moving from their MLS programs, which are often done online, to um, these like really, really white locations. <laughs> so you have these institutions that are trying to increase the diversity at their institution by bringing in a person of color um, who is maybe their only person of color, or one of very few people of color um, who doesn't have other people of color to work with um, in a place that is also very white. Um, and um, this is mm, to say, it's not necessarily um, a critique of the notion of residencies as a whole, but this is a particular challenge for residents, right? Um, and for any people of color who are going to be working at primarily white institutions, because you know, there's you don't stop being a person when you walk out of the library. So in addition to all of the challenges faced professionally within the walls of the library, you walk out and then have to deal with things like is are my kids going to fit in in the school district here, right? Um, are, they, are, are my kids going to be, am I going to be racially profiled walking home from school, from work? Um, is there a place nearby where I can get groceries uh, for the particular dietary needs or wants that I have? Um, I have to say that's the first thing that I looked at <laughs> when I just decided whether or not to come here was whether or not there was a large enough Korean population to sustain at least one grocery store, and there was. Um, you know, um, so for, for many reasons, residents can be, yeah, Melody, <laughs> um, for many reasons, it can be extremely isolating. Like, are there faith communities of your particular um, um, needs? Um, those are the, like extreme challenges that make it really difficult for PWIs to um, like attract talent that are people of color in the first place. And all of that compounds when you're a resident. Um, and the second thing is the lack of preparation. Residents in their institutions um, often don't have enough preparation. Um, institutions often will not have like a designated residency coordinator. Uh, my experience here is uh, when I started here, I assumed that it was kind of like a cookie cutter format, right? That other residents would be doing base, be experiencing basically the same thing, that they would have a coordinator, that they would have past residents they could look to primarily, you know, if it, if it wasn't a brand new residency, um, to look to for mentorship, that the other librarians there would be familiar with the program and have a general idea of what it was supposed to be and have buy-in um, and, you know, be willing and able to help and answer questions and um, so forth. Uh, but that is absolutely not the case. Um, diversity residencies are not standardized. There's not any particular, um, like, recommended, there's no, like, governing body of authority for residencies. So any institution can say, hey, we want to do that. Like, let's, let's do the thing to help increase this EDI pipeline thing. Like, that sounds good. Let's, let's do that. And then we can have our name on that list of being really helpful and, and like conscious and, you know, socially aware and helping with diversity. Um, but then there's um, either they don't look for recommendations and best practices and um, published material, um, which probably true. Um, or, uh, there's that, and there's also the fact that there is some, but not a ton, of published material. Um, there's not a lot of, of um, what's the word I'm looking for, literature um, on residencies specifically with best practices and that sort of thing. There is some, definitely is some, um, but certainly not as much as you would think there would be considering that residencies have been around for at least two decades now. Um, so residents will arrive at their residencies and maybe not have a specific designated coordinator, um, maybe not have um, any particular like stated goals or expectations or um, arrive and find that the other librarians don't really know what they're supposed to be doing them and calling them an intern and things like that. 
Um, so for a variety of reasons, um, institutions uh, um, can often really fail the residents in this way. And then also you have the, the fact that residents often apply to residencies without having like a really firm idea of what residencies are. Again, see the aforementioned like lack of literature. Um, or maybe have read one or two accounts or talked to one person assumed, like I did like in my early days here, that what they had heard was pretty much the same across the board and then arrive to find that the residency is not what they expected or not what was advertised to them. Um, so they will often leave their residency not having that preparation, either both not being prepared to enter the residency and then leave the residency without the preparation that it was ostensibly supposed to be providing to them to achieve greater success in their job hunt for you know, the next post-residency position and in their career overall. Um, so the LDI Institutes, um, which is, this information is available on our website, and if you Google it, you can find it as well, and I can send out links if you would like. Um, so, um, Dr. Halbert, a former dean, and Gerald had applied for a grant from IMLS, uh, which they got for a, um, a two-year grant to host um, two consecutive um, um, institutes. Um, <laughs> as, a, as a sort of pilot um, to address these issues specifically. Um, now, these are not the very first institutes that have for residents that have occurred ever. There have been prior institutes. Um, so just to clarify, these are not the only diversity um, residency or diversity alliance institutes um, to have ever occurred. There were some previously. Um, the thing is, they sort of came at it from separate angles and just all kind of combined into one. <laughs> I should have added a separate line for the 2019 Institute as well, which would have been the sixth Institute. Um, but the, the previous institutes were all run by, you know, very separate um, institutions. And although they were um, um, done in coordination with the Diversity Alliance, which is a task force um, in the ACRL, um, there wasn't, again, like the ACRL Diversity Alliance is not like a governing body. Um, they're just sort of this like loose affiliation of institutions that have, you know, decided that they're going to do the thing. Um, there's not, you know, a board that decrees like how um, residency should go. And they also did not run the institute. So the institutes were, were run by each institution separately. Um, and there wasn't a great deal of like coordination or cohesion between them. So the 2018 and 2019 Alliance, I'm sorry, institutes and the upcoming 2021, we'll see how that goes with lockdown and everything, but the plan upcoming 2021 um, are the most um, like, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Not cohesive, but um, it's it's the first time there have been several in a row run by the same um, people. Um, so it's not not in three years and does not a longitudinal study make or anything, but it it, it does provide us with a little more continuity. Um, so there were three primary goals for the Library Diversity Institutes project, and if you're interested, I can also send you the link to the IMLS grant. Um, so the the um, grant. Um, proposal so that you can read the, the full documentation, um, but basically three things, which was to establish the Institute for Incoming Diversity Residents, to establish a journal at the end of it, uh, which is just launching now, um, in the process of launching, um, and then to coordinate with ACRL programming. And these were the goal of all of these things were to address the two issues that I previously mentioned by creating a cohort. Um, so because institute residents are often, um, again, like I said, very isolated, um, having this cohort-like experience, um, having the grant funding. Oh, and that's another thing that sets these um, institutes at UNCG apart from the prior institutes is because there was the IMLS grant funding. Um, one of the extremely valuable benefits um, of the last two institutes is that we were able to use that grant funding to provide travel um, to cover travel expenses and lodging for all of the residents and not only to cover that for them but to, to prepay that so the residents would not have to do anything like coordinate with their institutions to use professional development funding or to spend their own money especially if they like me in the 2018 institute um, i was able to come to the 2018 institute at the end of uh, september right after i got my offer letter um, the day after I got my offer letter, I think. <laughs> um, and um, before I technically started. So I, I didn't start until October 1st. So I was not able to, I, I would not have been able to 
pay to come here by myself um, and attend the institute and then wait for reimbursement from them or I'm, you know, of IMLS funding through them or whatever. Um, but having that funding meant that um, the residents who were um, in financial difficulty, even those who weren't, just this is an equity issue, um, were able to have their travel prepaid, um, their lodging prepaid, um, basically in theory and food and everything else was all taken care of. So in theory, you could come to the Institute, learn what you needed to learn and leave. And all you would need to pay for is like your ride to the airport and your ride back home from the airport. Everything else was covered. Um, and that was an enormous benefit and really helpful to all of the residents. So because of that, many residents were able to participate and we were really able to create um, like a, 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 a cohort no, uh, ACRL membership is not required. The diversity line, it is terrifically expensive. Um, it is uh, uh, not required for this. Um, so we, we're doing it in, in um, coordination with the Diversity Alliance, which again defines um, diversity residencies as specifically targeting ethnic and racial minorities, which not all residencies do. And that's one reason why we have partnered with them is to be very targeted and specific in, in how we're defining diversity here. Um, so the institutions, I'm, I think to be a member of the Diversity Alliance in order to join a task force, um, you might need to be an ACRL member, but the um, you don't have to be an ACRL Diversity Alliance member to come to the Institute. Was that, that sounds clear as mud. <laughs> um, anyway, residents, the residents and the institution sending the residents do not need to come. Um, um, do not need that in order to be able to come. But the institutions, if you want to be able to have that ACL Diversity Alliance badge and to be part of, you know, like the, the board and to be talking about stuff, then you can you can do that that is required but um that is not necessary um that's not a necessary restriction uh for attendees or it wasn't i should say because the grant has come to an end um so yeah in addition to the great cohort experience a lot of other um projects came out of it because residents were able to meet each other um for this is one that i love to showcase um which our Juanita, who is, I believe, here, yeah, um, is a part of this particular effort. Um, so it's just the cohort experience was really powerful and 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 really lovely. Like it was, it was really beneficial for me, particularly being able to participate. Speaking as someone who attended the first one as a brand new upcoming resident with no idea really what to expect beyond what I had read, which was incomplete. Um, it did not give me a full picture of what um, residencies could or should be. Um, the Institute was incredibly helpful, not just because of the curriculum presented at the Institute, which involved presentations from Dr. Jace Alston, Dr. Leticia Velez, who is the second resident here and is an instructor in um, um, our IS program here at UNCG. Um, I, LIS, yeah, anyway. Um, as well as, um, let's see, Dr. Irene Owens, and you saw earlier, Dr. Wanda Brown was there, um, Dr. John Cawthorn, who is the incoming, outgoing, incoming, ACRL, wasn't it, I think, mm, well, it's time means nothing, it's all mixed together, incoming, there we go, I'm like, has it happened yet, or has it just been incoming for so long that I thought it had already happened, yeah, incoming, um, yeah, I think those were the first year's speakers. Yeah, and then we had a lot of continuity with the instructors. I know, right? We had a lot of continuity with instructors um, the second year as well. So we were able to repeat a lot of the, um, to keep again um, continuity with the, the same material for a curriculum. Um, but beyond that, beyond like learning, you know, like this is where a lot of gaps are in studies and residencies. This is, you know, what you should be experiencing. And if you're not, here's how maybe you can approach it. And here's some allies you can approach. And here's some strategies for you. Um, here are things for you to do some planning, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the most beneficial impact to me, and I feel like to a lot of other residents, um, just anecdotally, and I love that anecdata, um, is was being able to have that cohort like feeling um, and to be able to start off my residency where yeah that first year was super isolating. Um, just by the nature of what it is right um, being able to reach out through like the our private listserv through slack um, through the Facebook groups that we formed um, to um, reach out to our people who you know we 
one of the major parts of the um, the institute was these cohort building activities where um, like not only getting to know each other but finding out where your shared interests lie finding out where your shared research interests lie um, what your shared backgrounds are and so a lot of us made a made a lot of like pretty instant and really deep connections and have since that time been um, you know um, looking to each other for being for partners on you know book proposals on conference proposals on if, on things like this like the women of color libraries uh, website which showcases diverse voices um, in library land um, and so forth um, it has really really been an amazing opportunity for residents who maybe previously would not have had any chance to really get to know other residents who share your particular um, like obviously we a lot of us have shared background as well with you know many of us coming from immigrant backgrounds all of us being people of color and so forth right um, but then this the particulars of the residency experience um, and of being in a precarious term limited position um, of the politics around being a a person who is maybe supposed to or expected to bring diversity programming with you to a very wide institution thankfully not the case here but many of my um, um, peers and, um, and other residents for them that is very much the case um, or maybe having been promised that even though your title is diversity resident your work does not have to have anything to do with EDI um, equ equity diversity inclusion only to find when you get there that oh no everybody is looking dumping all of their vaguely diversity related projects onto you um like there are some very specific things that are uh, particular to resident experiences and it's been so nice to be able to have like that particular like friend group already established going into it it's been very helpful so let's see i'm at 30 minutes i didn't want this to go super long because i can't talk for 45 minutes or an hour <laughs> straight. Um, but um, the next bit, I, um, I think in my blurb, I said I would talk about some of the current um, conversations slash trends or whatever um, in library land regarding residencies. Um, and then I guess open it up to questions, chats, if you've got any. Um, and um, if we don't end up using all of that time, you can reclaim your time <laughs> and go about the rest of your day. Because Lord knows we certainly have enough Zoom chats as it is. Um, Although I do appreciate you coming here to listen to me ramble about this. So um, some things that I thought I'd mention um, is there's lots of conversation about whether or not diversity residencies are even accomplishing their stated mission of actually increasing the EDI pipeline, right? Like looking at some of the stats that I pointed out earlier, um, it's whiteness and librarianship is staying pretty steady. Um, so either, I mean, to be fair, residency programs are specific to academic librarianship which is a very small subset of librarianship um, that being said those numbers have not changed so much either um, and i sorry i should have prepared like the specific stats for this that i did not think to and i will next time um so this is a conversation that you find going on a lot um and there's not a lot of um solid answers there <laughs> um i think if I were to give an answer, I would say no, residencies really aren't accomplishing their state admission. Um, a lot of residents burn out um, during their residency um, because of the challenges within their residency and end up leaving academic librarianship. I can think of, um, I was supposed to be on a panel at TLA, um, Texas Library Association in March before all of the shutdown stuff started happening. Um, it was one of the early ones that, that did, you know, finally, belatedly, a little too late, in my opinion, close. Um, and I was supposed to be on a panel there with three other residents from my first cohort. Um, and between the time that we proposed the panel and the time the panel was accepted, three out of four of us, and I'm the one remaining, had left their residencies and left academic librarianship. Um, yeah so that's again anecdata data is what it is it's just an anecdote but i can tell you from the research that i've been doing um and by research i mean just like the data that i've been collecting for sending out invites and stuff when i was involved with planning last year's um, diversity institute and also in planning this one is that there's about 80 residencies active in the u.s or ostensibly active in the u.s um at a given time 
Um, and of those, like maybe 70 actual residents um, because searches fail um, or people leave their residencies early or so forth, right? Um, and so there's, it's not a large, it's not a large cohort. <laughs> there's not a ton of us. Um, so I, there's not a lot of like three out of four from a sample population of four out of like 70 is kind of significant actually, right? Um, so that's, that, that's kind of been the case um, across the board from 2000, uh, sorry, from, from the last, from like 85-ish maybe, uh, when um, the first residencies really got um, on board. They left it because um, they were, um, tired of the issues that they got better offers with more money um, where they could uh, where they didn't have to, to 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 move super far and leave their family or because they were given an option to telework two out of three of them um, talked about you know, having the option to telework um, which as you know many academic libraries are a little more reluctant to give or they were <laughs> until those forced a lot of people's hands right um, so we'll see if that changes things and if that, um, if that additional flexibility that maybe some institutions are hopefully going to start allowing might change things there. Um, but often it just comes down to, you know, having more flexibility, being offered more money, um, and also just, there's a lot like, and again, anecdotally, there's a lot of burnout just because we're constantly talking about race and constantly dealing with microaggressions or straight up macroaggressions. Um, and, you know, if you're a resident who's at an institution where maybe you don't have a good coordinator, you don't have a coordinator, you don't have someone to look out for you, um, you don't have buy-in at your institution, they keep treating you like you're an intern, um, your research interest has nothing to do with EDI, but you keep getting EDI stuff dumped onto you, yeah, after two years of that, you might want to leave. <laughs> you want to just be done with it, uh, which is unfortunate, but is um, sadly more often the case than not. Um, and on top of that, there's a difficulty in measuring success, right? Like I've been talking about the anecdata that I have just from being in conversations quite regularly with residents all the time, um, informally, um, but there's not been any longitudinal studies of residents um, from, you know, early days of residencies measuring like what they went on to do, whether or not they stayed in academic librarianship. Um, yeah, Jason Letitia, even like, you know, two of um, our previous five went on to get PhDs, uh, which again, like, do you measure that as a success or a non-success though, right? If the goal is to retain them into academic librarianship, then it's not. If the goal is help these people go on to get a job, a good job, to boost their career no matter what, then it is a success. Um, and there's a debate there as well as to whether or not that should, like, how narrowly should we define the goal? Um, another conversation, sorry, um, I'm talking a lot, not breathing. <laughs> um, another uh, conversation that we're having that's related to this is um, whether or not residencies are the best or a good method of, of ostensibly, you know, increasing the EDI pipeline in academic librarianship. Um, um, April Hathcock wrote a really great article. Um, to last year, two years ago, two years ago, 2018, I think fall 2018 library journal. Um, and she wrote a blog post as well about like, why do you, wait, no, April's was a blog post. There was another library journal article. Sorry, I'm getting confused. It was like they were published around the same time. Um, so, you know, why won't you keep us, right? Like, um, which posits that institutions will create these residencies, which are term limited, precarious, you know, that is one line for, and so they have that one person of color fulfilling that line at all times and don't have to worry about the rest of them. So they've checked out the tick box of like, okay, we're, you know, the ticked off the tick box, there we go, of, you know, doing our part for being diverse. We're socially conscious and being diverse because we have this one position and there's at least one person of color at all times and maybe only just the one, but at least the one and it is reserved for them. So at least that's the one. Um, and don't feel any need to then really look at, you know, why the rest of maybe their staff and librarians are so are 
are not as diverse as they could be and not really looking at the structural inequalities at play their institution, not just in the libraries, but really tackling the challenges um, like more broadly across their entire institution. Um, and, you know, within like their city, within their town <laughs> that are keeping, you know, um, talented people of color from, from joining their staff, from joining um, their um, faculty rankings. So, um, and that's, that's often, the, I think, like a strong case can be made for that is that residencies um, allow people to fulfill, to feel like they've, they've done their part, they've got their quota, don't have to do anything else. So in that case, should residencies just be done away with as a whole? Um, and just should people just really emphasize institutions hiring people in, you know, permanent positions? Now, I would say that for me, I think that there is a case to be made for residencies and I can, this is a whole separate thing that I will not delve into at length here because I'm losing my voice. <laughs> but um, I think there is a case to be made because I think the, the gap that residencies fill is really um, addressing a problem in how LIS programs do practicums. Um, but that's that's a whole other soapbox. That, that's a whole other can of worms. Um, so I think there is a case to be made for why residency should exist. But I think often the people who end up in residencies um, are recent graduates and you know early professional librarians of color who couldn't find non-residency permanent positions. You know, it didn't specify, um, but I can I'll, I'll have to dig up. I think it was a library journal article, um, but that was my assumption, yes, uh, but I'm not 100% sure. Brown, to answer. And oh, sorry, for the people who are listening to the recording, I'm sorry. Uh, Brown asked if the previous slide with percentages, um, whether or not that was solely permanently employed individuals. Um, I'll have to look at that again, but that was my understanding, yeah. Um, Let's see. So yeah, that's another thing that's, you know, it's a constant conversation between residents and coordinators and, you know, especially former residents who really feel like their residencies maybe um, did not do right by them um, and are not seeing it doing right by other people as well. Um, and just to, you know, really question the entire premise of, of, the, of the effort. Um, and, you know, I don't know, like, um, before all of this COVID stuff came about again, I would have said, I think that, you know, the, the real problem is with the, the workforce. The problem is that we're churning out more librarians than there are positions for. The problem is that we're not really equipping recent grads um, to, to get those first positions. Um, even Tool, I believe it was, did, what is this? Was it 2012? Um, he did a study um, looking at, um, I think over the course of like six months to a year, he scraped job postings and um, looked at, you know, what percentage of them included keywords that would indicate that they were for early career professionals, right? Um, using specific, you know, words like the, like early career or, you know, recent grads, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and based on what he was able to find, um, it looked like about, now I always get these numbers mixed up. I think his was that it was about 25% of them were ostensibly looking for early career, you know, recent grads. Then when following up with those um, and asking who fulfilled those, those early career positions? Like who filled them? Was it an early career person? Only 20% of those were actually filled by early career um, or um, recent grads, right? And so like, that's not a lot, Bob. <laughs> so if you're an early career professional and you're, you're applying for jobs already, not only do you not have a lot of jobs available to you, but you can expect that, um, you know, 75 to 80% of those are going to go to people who have more experience and are not actually early career. So the amount of jobs that are actually going to go to early career professionals are not a lot. Um, so in my opinion, I think that's really that and the way that we do practicum education and um, the whole like practical experience component of this very practice-based 
discipline um, are really the roots of the problem that residencies are trying to address, right? Um, and until those go away, I think there will always be a place for residencies. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should not also be pushing for all of the other things. What I always say is that I think residencies can be can and should be one part of the EDI ecosystem and academic librarianship, but it has to be a thriving ecosystem. There has to be like biodiversity there, right? <laughs> and not to pun <laughs> on diversity there, but um, you have to have many different efforts going on at the same time and they have to be complementary to each other um, because residencies are not a good fit for everybody like my residency is good for me because i left my lis program feeling like well i've got experience on paper but i don't actually have a really good idea of how academic librarianship works as a whole i'm a first generation student um i didn't really get to see behind the scenes of like what goes on in academia i don't understand tenure i don't know i didn't know until like i graduated that there was a difference between a research university and a teaching university like in colleges like what's a college versus a university what do you mean all those people who are I call professor are not professors like those are all things I did not know um, the really basic stuff that you would need to know to be able to thrive <laughs> if you're going to go into academic librarianship right um, so for me this residency was a great fit for me because it allows me to kind of flit around from department to department and pick different things but if I had just like picked a job and gotten that job many supervisors would not allow me to do things that are that are outside or too much outside the scope of what my job is meant to be, right? So if I had immediately gotten a job and was like, oh, I think, sure, I wanna be a subject liaison. And then I'm looking over at the DMC, I'm looking over at school and I'm like, actually, oh, that's really interesting. Maybe I should have done those things instead. Like there's not a lot of opportunity um, to, you know, like go between departments, like, well, actually, I don't know, like we might be pretty flexible here, but in a lot of institutions, they're not, right? So for me, this was a great opportunity for other people, especially recent grads who were like, no, I want to be an archivist. It is what I want to be, right? Like I want to work with this specific thing. I know exactly what I want or often the case, I actually have lots of years of library experience and know what I'm doing. And I only just recently got my MLS. I don't, I'm not actually a new professional at all. Um, I've been a professional in this field for a long time. It's just the, you know, library land doesn't consider my past experience to be real experience, which is another thing got some words about that um for not now um you know then a residency is not maybe great for them because they know what they're doing they don't need the experience they don't need the scaffolding they don't need to play around and keep like you know play testing various um different types of academic librarianship to find out if it's the right fit for them so the residency is not a good fit in that case there are other things that we need to address their challenges um all of which is to say again i think Ideally, there's there's a case to be made for residencies, but with the next bullet point, how is COVID-19 impacting this? Like, it's impacting it a lot. <laughs> it's impacting it a lot. Um, with budget cuts coming down the line, on many institutions going into um, what is it? Um, not insolvency. What's the word I'm looking for? Exigency, financial exigency already. Um, cutting tenure lines, etc. Um, it's it's really further precarious. So you have an entire cohort of around 70, 80 recent librarians of color, um, recent grads of color, sorry, and early professionals who are a big chunk of the new cohort of librarians of color that are in these term limited positions that are in, in danger. <laughs> um, many of them are, um, there are not very many right now who are plan going to be graduating this year or next year, sorry, graduating, um, finishing their terms this year or next year. There's only like, I think around like, there's under 10 of us um, who are going to be ending our terms in um, 2020 or 2021. Um, the others have already left or have longer terms because they just started. Um, so that's good. Um, and some institutions have already moved swiftly to transition their residents, like when this all started happening in March, into permanent positions as quickly as possible. And that's also great. But many are not able to, many are unwilling to, and so forth. So that's, um, that's definitely an issue on residents and, and fellows' minds right now. Um, and does the nature of residencies increase burnout of librarians of color? I think I've already talked about this over the course of the slides, so I won't belabor this point too much. The answer is yes. Um, I think a lot of it is bottom meinhof syndrome, you know, where because you're addressing it all the time, because you're talking about it all the time, you just see it all the time. Um, 
And so for me, for example, like my professional interests are not technically, you know, I'm, I'm interested in digital preservation and digital stewardship and like the government information, that sort of thing. Like that's what my professional, where my professional interests lie. Um, but because of the nature of this, this job and unlike some of my peers who did not want to and were not were promised they wouldn't have to, I understood that this job would involve that component, was happy to do so, I am happy to do so, um, have been pleased with doing that work here. Um, but I will say like by nature of constantly being in conversations with residents, having residents reach out to me to talk about issues that they're having at their institutions because I feel supported here and I don't mind speaking out on their behalf, but many of them cannot because you know there's only so much detail you can get into about an issue you're having at your institution when you're the only person who could possibly be having that problem problem at that particular institution or at that kind of institution. It's very easy to narrow down who is complaining, you know, maybe subtweeting things on Twitter or something, and to figure out who it is and to be retaliated against, which is why I often, and I don't know about often, but you will find me going on screeds on Twitter about its issues at certain institutions, um, which are not directed at mine per se, but because people are able to come to me um, and that I can try to make noise about it on their behalf because I feel supported here where I am. Um, and yeah, it, I'm, I, I wouldn't say I'm burned out, but um, it's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> And I would say that compared to a lot of other residents, my, I'm quite fortunate in my situation here. Like I'm, I'm quite satisfied with my residency um, and I feel very well supported here. Um, and I still find it to be a lot to deal with because I'm just hearing these stories over and over and over again and we're debating these issues over and over and over again. Um, so yeah, I think the nature of them does increase uh, burnout on my brains of color, but also like, what do you, what do, you do about that? I don't know, it's tough. So questions, I have been talking nonstop for, for like 50 minutes. Uh, please uh, unmute your mics if you can. <laughs> um, Jenny, feel free to take Yeah, I'll pull in a couple from the chat. Okay. Um, so Brown asked, how do academic programs percentages correlate with employment with regard to diversity? So are there significant programs for increasing the pipeline for EDI and librarianship at the pre-graduate level? I wondered about this as well, if there are programs in place. Um, cause to me, it seems like a lot of times library schools are more diverse than librarianship is, or yeah. the academic librarianship. Mm -hmm. Wondered in terms of recruitment into library schools, like how is it, are there, are there programs, are there systems um, in place that help try to attract? Um, so, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, to my knowledge, there are a few here and there. Um, like we've, we, we have a thing here that we did, right? Um, at UNCG, I, the name of it escapes me. Um, nope, it's gone, I can't think of it, but there, there was one here at our LIS program, right? Um, and there are some piecemeal, but as far as I'm aware, um, there's not been sort of a systemic effort in that, and I certainly think that would help. Um, but I think, like if the problem is there's not enough jobs overall like recruiting more people <laughs> i don't know if i don't know if that's the the answer um as for um academic programs percentages i don't know if you mean programs like academic library school programs um or academic librarianship overall but my understanding given the last set of arl numbers i should have prepped those up um before this um is it's pretty similar and holding steady and has been holding steady. Uh, if that inadequately answers your question, Brown. <laughs> um, we had some conversation in the chat just about um, the difficulty with getting a job, um, kind of going along with, with what you were talking about. Um, and, um, you know, Amanda mentioned applying to lots of positions right out of library school. I think that's probably a uh, sentiment many of us <laughs> are familiar mm -hmm. with and Juanita um, mentioned that most job descriptions are written with experienced librarians in mind. It's implicitly stated coupled with the highly specialized nature of academic library makes the problem worse. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about like my experience on search committees during my career. I think it's hard because when you when you set up um, requirements or preferences, they don't ever really let you set like 
a maximum, right? So there's a situation where you can be like, we really only want people who have three or fewer years of experience. Mm-hmm. It makes the situation even more complicated. Um, right. Yeah. Frustrating. Yeah. There's lots of systemic challenges, right? And it's everything from like how your resume, CV intake database allows you to input or limit things like that, right? Um, and, or whether or not like your HR department lets you, things like that. Um, so there's lots of challenges that are not, I think, specific to libraries. They're, you know, like endemic to academia overall. Um, but it's the job of library leadership to push back against like university leadership. Do you know what I mean? Like that's the place where those conversations need to be happening and those changes need to be made. Um, which is hard to do. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And then Lois asked, um, said this may have already been answered slash not relevant, but in considering library diversity, are those stats specifically looking at librarians or do they include all library staff? My understanding of the particular ALA one that I was looking at was it's what they would consider to be librarians. So it doesn't include library staff. I think if you included library staff, the numbers would be much higher. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think that, sorry, Susan, I'm reading Susan's comment. 25 years ago, almost none of our non-faculty staff and LIS degrees, now so many do, the job market must be so flooded. Yeah, like if you, you know, again, that study that Eamon did was, um, like, I think he ended up looking at like under a thousand, like around eight, nine hundred uh, job postings. Let's see if I can find it again. I need to stop citing things that I just like saw randomly and like calculated like and did a Twitter thread about and actually save it somewhere where I can cite it properly. Um, but um, like, so 20% of 25% is five, right? So for every hundred job postings, five of them will actually be filled with someone who is early career. Um, so it's terrifically competitive, and now with COVID and all of the budgets tightening for um, everybody, but also academic institutions, it's going to be even more of a challenge. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, I need to start using Zotero properly <laughs> instead of just like a bookmarking random Twitter threads. <laughs> One of my former LIS 200 students um, told me that he felt like Zotero was um, Pinterest for articles. It's true. <laughs> Which I, I really that. liked. Yeah. Oh man, if it were if it were like a better like graphical interface. Oh no, no. I most journal most academic journals have really hideous covers. Never mind. I don't want the gra- I don't want the graphic focus. No, it's fine. Zotero is fine as it is. <laughs> um. Yeah. Anything else? We got five minutes. Um, I can chat about the residency here, PDS stuff here. But okay, sounds like everybody's done. So, all right. Well, thanks for coming. Um, I hope you learned a thing, maybe. Um, if you've got further questions or would like me to follow up with any of these stats, um, I'm happy to do so. Actually, I'm going to copy paste these for an idea to remind myself of which things I need to actually add proper numbers and better citations for. Um, yeah, thanks, everybody. Um, oh, assessment form, yeah. Yes, please fill out the assessment form. We use it to help us think about future programming. Um, I want to especially thank Deborah for being willing to present such a beautiful slide deck uh, for giving us all lots to think about. And I also want to thank all of you for participating. Um, I really, really appreciate it. And as many of you may have seen in my last weekly update email, I am looking for more ULVLC content please contact me if there's anything you're interested in presenting. That would be super. Great. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye, all. Bye.